Good morning, everybody. Buen dia. Um, welcome to this special event uh, here at the USC uh, campus. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, panel here. And to introduce us, to welcome our distinguished guests, we're going to hear a few words from uh, Dean Amber Miller. Good morning. Welcome to USC, and thank you all for being here, both in person and virtually. Um, as the Summit of the Americas in LA wraps up um, a really busy week, we are happy to host this dialogue here on our campus. As you know, we have a number of distinguished panelists with us here this morning to discuss democracy and its challenges in Latin America. And as we, re as we think through these complex issues, I have no doubt that we will recognize um, many familiar themes with those that we are grappling with here in the United States. Divisive politics have hit many Latin American countries hard in recent years, and democratic governments are struggling with economic inequality, corruption, and violence, ensuring free and fair elections, and other very familiar kinds of issues to those that we are coping with here. And as we've seen here at home, the COVID-19 pandemic has not made things any easier. Today, we have the opportunity to convene a dialogue on these important issues with some of the most influential leaders in Latin America who are going to provide their perspective on the state of democracy and the possible path to a brighter future. So I am very much looking forward to hearing from them. It's a pleasure particularly to host this event here at USC where we have long been focused on developing a robust presence and a wide variety of collaborations in Latin America. Two of our eight international offices are located in the region, in Mexico City and in Sao Paulo. We have academic partnerships throughout Latin America in Alzheimer's research, business and supply chain studies, engineering, pharmacy, Holocaust studies, fine arts, and I personally have a collaboration that I work on down in the high Atacama Desert in Chile. Um, at USC Dornsife, our departments of political science and international relations and Latin and Iberian cultures conduct important research on the region and its influence on the global stage. We have Maymester programs with students traveling abroad to explore topics like biodiversity in Mexico and traditional languages in Peru, just to name a couple. And we recently launched a new center for Latinx and Latin American studies, which is working to expand transnational collaboration while empowering our students, many of whom have close family ties in the region to lead dialogues among our many Latin American communities across Los Angeles. The dialogue this morning will be moderated by our own Professor of Political Science and International Relations, Jerry Monk. Among his research interests, Professor Monk examines democracy and state capacity in Latin America. He's the author of several books and many, many journal articles. Professor Monk was instrumental in the preparation of the UN Development Program's Democracy in Latin America report and developing a methodology to monitor elections for the Organization of American States. So we have a lot to cover. We couldn't be in better hands. So it is now my pleasure to turn the program over to Professor Jerry Monk to welcome our special guests. I hope you enjoy the program. I know that I will. Thank you again for being here. Thank you very much, Andrew. Well, good morning. Buen dia a todos. Uh, my name is Jerry Monk, Gerardo Monk, uh, Gerardo Monk in Spanish. Uh, I'm professor here at USC in political science and IR. I'll be the moderator uh, of this panel. Um, the aim of this panel is to have a conversation, a frank discussion about democracy, about what's working with democracy, what's not working with democracy, um, how to improve the state of democracy. We're gonna be focusing on Latin America, but I'm sure with this panel, we're gonna go beyond Latin America. Many people are very concerned about the state of democracy in the United States. So I can see the conversation spilling over uh, to other uh, countries. If we think about Latin America in a historical perspective, this is a good time for democracy in Latin America. Only a few decades ago, the region was dominated by dictators. Uh, now the situation is very, very different. Elections are held as a matter of routine. Uh, we see the peaceful alternation in power among competing power, uh, parties on a frequent basis. If anybody was tuning into the, the hearings uh, Congress last night, you realize what a big deal the peaceful alternation in power uh, is. 
candidates from across the political spectrum buy uh, for political office. Uh, if you're following what's happening in Colombia these days, we see very different uh, uh, candidates. Um, seven countries within the region have elected women to the highest political office. If we compare Latin America to other regions in the, the developing South, the global South, there's no region that can match the record of democratic accomplishments that Latin America has. I'm sure we're gonna be talking about problems, but it's important to start about the positive things to build on. Uh, sort of this is uh, in some sense a good moment to think about how to improve by building on democratic achievements. Obviously this positive picture is only half of the picture. Um, there are other important uh, things that need to be addressed. We cannot avoid noticing that three countries in the region are dictatorships. This is Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua. If we look at other countries, and my students that have taken my courses know we discuss these issues a lot, we have major problems related to violence, corruption, poverty and inequality, environmental degradation. There's a sense of disconnect between politicians and citizens. Many analysts talk about a crisis of representation. So not all is well with democracy in Latin America. It's important to discuss these problems. More important, it's important to think about concrete steps that can be taken to improve uh, the problems in the region. I couldn't think of a better panel to discuss these issues facing the region. More globally, the discussion about uh, democracy around the world. We have with us, um, and I'll introduce them in the order in which they're, they're seated, Leonel Fernandez, former president of the Dominican Republic. He served for three terms. Um, so has uh, important experience in government during a very important period in the history of the Dominican Republic. He's the founder of a think tank, uh, Funglore. Um, I think you're now the honorary president uh, of that uh, organization. He's very active in discussions uh, within the Dominican Republic uh, throughout the region. Uh, welcome, president. Uh, we have with us uh, Laura Chinchiza, uh, former president of uh, Costa Rica. And somebody, if you sort of move around international circles, she appears in every organization playing an important uh, role. So uh, some former presidents, whatever, the Republicans here play golf. Others are very active <laughs> in politics. Uh, President Chinchija certainly stands out uh, in that regard. She has an important role in two of the organizations uh, that we have represented here. She's co-chair of the Inter-American Dialogue. Um, she's vice chair of the Board of International uh, Idea. She's vice president of the Club de Madrid. Uh, so she's very involved in the ongoing discussion uh, about democracy development uh, in Latin America. Next, we have Kevin Casas uh, Zamora. He's the Secretary General of International Idea. International Idea is an intergovernmental organization based in Sweden, uh, dedicated, and this is the one organization really focused on the promotion, the defense uh, of uh, democracy. Um, before this, he was Vice President of Costa Rica. Uh, he was also Secretary of Political Affairs of the Organization of American States. Um, this is a group that oversees election monitoring within the hemisphere, uh, plays a very important role in protecting democracy uh, within the region. Sitting next to, uh, to Kevin, we have Rebecca Bill Chavez. She is President and CEO of the Inter-American Dialogue. This is a think tank based in DC. Uh, here at USC, we feel we have a special connection with the dialogue. Uh, Professor Emeritus uh, Abe Lowenthal was a founding director uh, of uh, the dialogue. Um, so we wish you all the best uh, in this new role. Uh, she worked in the Obama administration uh, for several years as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Defense uh, for Western Hemisphere. Uh, affairs. She's a recovering academic. She used to be an academia. Now she's moved on, uh, determined to make a difference uh, with the knowledge uh, that she has. Finally, we have Luis Felipe Lopez uh, Calva. He's an economist by training. Um, he works uh, in the United Nations. He's a UN Assistant Secretary General, and he is director of uh, the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program for Latin America and the Caribbean. This is sort of in some sense the UN's main development uh, branch 
uh, working within uh, Latin America. Uh, the UNDP, like the USAID in the US, started as an agency focused on economic issues. Their portfolio has broadened out dealing with democratic governance intersection between economic and political uh, affairs. Uh, so it's great to have uh, Luis Felipe uh, here with us. Uh, we're going to break down this panel into three parts. We'll start with uh, questions I'm going to pose to each of the panelists. I'm gonna ask for short three minute responses. Take this to be your opening comment. You're gonna have plenty of time to talk after that. Then we move into a second segment in which I'd like to have a more of an open fluid discussion among the panelists. I may have some follow up questions. Then we're gonna to open to the floor. The people that are watching us online, they can send uh, questions in uh, through uh, the chat. We're going to end at 12. Um, we're going to have lunch boxes set up outside, so hopefully people can stay on and continue the conversation at that point in time. Okay. Empecemos. <laughs> President Fernandez, um, you stepped down after a long time in the presidency of the Dominican Republic uh, about 10 years ago. Um, a fair amount has changed in the region. These have been hectic uh, years, a lot of things happening, particularly the last few. Uh, what do you see as the main changes in the region? What are the new challenges that are taking shape? I'm thinking challenges related to democracy. What are the opportunities that you see uh, to improve democracy in the region? This is a very broad question, but just some opening statements. Okay, thank you, Professor Monk, for your very kind invitation. and. Greetings uh, to my colleagues at the panel, and thank you uh, to all of you for being here today. Well, yes, I, I left office in 2012, so it's been exactly 10 years, and many things have happened uh, in Latin America, of course. I would say, putting, putting it in context, that uh, we have been going through different economic and political electoral cycles. For example, between 2003 and 2013, uh, Latin America went through what has been labeled as the, the golden decade uh, in the region in terms of economic growth and development. In those 10 years, uh, for the first time in its economic history, Latin America grew, uh, averaged nearly 4.5%. But that was because, uh, because China was demanding many of our commodities in the region. So oil, natural gas, soybeans, copper, whatever, China was buying because it was growing at a 12% average per year. But around 2013, uh, that experienced a drop. And the next five years, now I'm out of office, the next five years, uh, Latin America only grew around 0.8% according to ECLAC, right? In those years, we began experiencing social protests. In, it began in Venezuela, but also in Brazil, in Peru, in Colombia, in Chile, just about everywhere, we were having social protests. And then came the pandemic. And the pandemic was not only uh, a, a healthcare crisis, it's been a multi-dimensional crisis with impact in economics uh, and social well-being of the population. Because of the pandemic, there has been an increase in poverty. Uh, because of the pandemic, first of all, there was, uh, I would say, a severe economic contraction. And because of that, uh, our central banks uh, increase their monetary policies, and governments uh, expanded their 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 uh, uh, public uh, public expenditures. That was uh, that enabled uh, our countries in the region to kind of initiate a recovering process. But now we are because of that because uh, because we had to increase our government spending, and because the central banks increased their monetary uh, offerings, their monetary supply. Inflation has taken place in the region. And inflation has become, I would say, one of the most, uh, um, one of the most, I would say, painful situation in the region because uh, people have lost their purchasing power. Uh, if we look at the last two years, an accumulated inflation of over 25%, especially on foodstuff. Now, uh, to deal with the issue, uh, we have to increase interest rates at the central bank and we have to uh, reduce uh, liquidity in the financial system. And what is going to come because of that? It'll, there'll be a halt in economic growth. There'll be more unemployment. And inflation will not be wiped away because we have the, uh, 
the war mm -hmm. between Russia and Ukraine uh, with the increase of the oil price and natural gas and fertilizers and other commodities. So inflation will not disappear. And most likely we will face in the next few years in Latin America, some sort of recession or eventually stagflation, which will be very negative. Now, this has had already an electoral impact, political impact. Mm -hmm. In the last 14 presidential elections in Latin America, the ruling parties have lost 13. Only in Nicaragua, the, the ruling party has been able to stay in power because they imprison all the opposition leaders. So the situation looks a little bit bleak uh, for the region. It doesn't look well because of the economic and social impact we're having before the pandemic, aggravated by the pandemic. And there seems to be now some sort of correlation between uh, trends in global economy and its impact politically uh, and socially uh, in our countries in Latin America. So these are the challenges we're looking basically. Of course, we have challenges in terms of democratic governance, violence, drug trafficking, corruption, transparency, uh, the impact of social media technologies in the region. In education, there was uh, education was interrupted due to the lockdown created by the pandemic. And now we need to go back, not only to where we were before, but to create new models of, uh, of uh, relationship between teaching and learning in, in, in the region, because we're way behind. We're way behind from K to 12 and in higher education. So I don't know if I'm over my time, but in general, this is the way we look at, at, the, at the region at this moment. Thank you very much. Um, President Chinchilla, I want to ask you a similar sort of broad question about how you see the region, democracy, its challenges. Uh, you come from Costa Rica. Um, if some country within the Americas is in a position to give classes on democracy, um, it used to be the United States, probably not sort of Costa Rica is probably the, the one that has the strongest democratic tradition now. So from that perspective, but sort of from all the engagements that you have in these debates, um, just how do you view things? Thank you, Professor, um, for asking and mentioning uh, the case of Costa Rica. Um, of course, we are having uh, also challenges in terms of democratic governance, but of course, they are not as um, as pressing as uh, it is happening in other countries of our region. Uh, I think that Lionel uh, provided a wonderful um, uh, contextualization of the, um, the situation in our region and how it, it has evolved during the last years in terms of social and economic uh, terms in terms of social and, and, and economic uh, perspectives. Uh, I would like to emphasize a little bit more on the institutional side because uh, according to this uh, context that Lionel presented, uh, what we can see is that we are having uh, a you know, growing demands coming from the population because there are many overlapping crises uh, impacting negatively the economic and social indicators in our region. And in certain way, it is, um, it is, it is telling us uh, about the big challenge that our democracies uh, have in terms of delivering, in terms of responding to those long-term uh, structural change challenges that we have. Um, and and, and that, is, that is something that we, 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 we have to put in the first place. I mean, these kind of uh, challenges of delivering, of responding to the demands of the citizens. But I would like to emphasize two other kind of challenges, um, two kind of trends uh, that I see concerning our democratic governance. One is the crisis, what I call the crisis of representation. And the other one is a demand, a growing demand uh, for citizen participation. Concerning the crisis of representation, we have to recognize that trust in institutions um, is weakening, effectively uh, affecting especially the institutions of the representative democracy, uh, specifically uh, the political parties and the parliaments. Uh, let me give you some figures. According to the Latino Barometro and as an average, only 30% of citizens uh, say they trust political parties. And the figure is 20% in the case of Congresses. Uh, 
Uh, in addition, and this is uh, something uh, really concerning, over 70% of citizens consider that their governments only benefit a few powerful groups. So these figures reflect uh, a crisis of the collective mechanisms, uh, the, 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 the institutions that are called to aggregate interest uh, in order to reach broad agreements in a democracy. If those vehicles are not responding because the people do not trust in them anymore, that means that we have to do something about that. Um, because uh, the distrust in those institutions is also impacting negatively uh, the way the citizens perceive democracy, the support to democracy. In fact, support to democracy in our region uh, has moved from around 65% uh, at the beginning of uh, the, uh, the uh, 20, 20, 2010 to 48 uh, and 50% during the last three years. The other issue that I mentioned is a growing demand uh, for citizen participation. And we have to recognize that citizens, on one hand, they are not trusting enough in the traditional institutions. But on the other hand, they are not only voting, and that is a very good signal, that is something positive uh, that we have to take into account when analyzing the opportunities that we have in the region, uh, people still consider voting as something positive. Uh, and they, they are turning out to vote during this electoral cycle amid this complex crisis we are going through. However, when we ask the people, um, uh, we disaggregate the, 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 uh, the, uh, the figures uh, of those who consider that voting is something positive, we will find that there is an important uh, portion uh, of them who say that you should always vote, but also you should protest. That means that they are saying, look, this is not only about voting. I want to be taken into account, uh, you know, I want, I want my voice to be heard. And, and so those, according to those numbers, it, it shouldn't be surprising to see all of this mass mobilization and protest that uh, have taken the streets uh, and the cities uh, in Latin America. So to finalize, I will say that uh, we have a big challenge concerning the uh, democratic governance in our countries, and that is how to renew and rewire the traditional uh, channels of democratic participation, uh, mainly parliaments and uh, political parties, while at the same time trying to design and putting forward new mechanisms for citizen participation. Uh, in my own terms, this is not an either or challenge. I think it is very urgently to try to move forward in both, you know, in both kind of, um, of challenges. Um, the, I, 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 I hear many people saying, uh, look, democracy, has shown to be resilient in Latin America. So we should be optimistic that we will be able to overcome this crisis. Uh, I do not agree with that. I think that we don't have much more time and that in certain way we should aspire uh, that democracy is not only resilient in our hemisphere, but also that democracy uh, should transcend and take into account the new kind of demands coming from the population, especially the youth. Thank you. Thanks, that was wonderful. Kevin, you had an organization, International Idea, that does something unique, I think something very, very needed. Uh, your organization publishes on a regular basis a report on the global state of democracy. So this covers the entire world. We really don't have anything like that. 
using great data, great analysis of data to tell us about the state of democracy, weaknesses, trends. Could you, drawing upon sort of the discussions I'm sure you've had within your organization, uh, discuss some of the global trends, maybe put Latin America within some more global context? Sure, thank you so much, uh, Jerry. It's wonderful to see you, it's wonderful to be here, it's wonderful to be uh, doing this panel uh, in partnership with USC and with Punglode, it's an honor. Uh, also to share this discussion with my fellow panelists, all of them extraordinarily distinguished. Um, look, I won't bore you with all the details and all the findings that uh, came up in the process of uh, drafting the Global State of Democracy Report, the last iteration of which came out uh, last November, but I will identify some of the some of the main findings and how they relate to the situation in Latin America. I mean, one one of the things that we've been detecting whenever we measure the performance of democracy globally, and for some years now, is a a, a worldwide deterioration in the quality of democratic governance. Uh, the quality of democracy is being eroded uh, all over the world and in, in, in very, you know, a, across the board, you know, all aspects of democracy pretty much are being uh, weakened. And this is something that we're also seeing in Latin America. I mean, one of the, one of the most interesting uh, data points coming out a, of you know, public opinion surveys in, in Latin America is this is something that I find really a, important from the, from the standpoint of diagnosing the situation of democracy in Latin America, which is this, when you ask people whether a, they support democracy in the abstract, a majority of people in Latin America still say that they do. When you there's another group of people that say, oh, well, you know, we prefer an authoritarian option. That proportion is not growing. What is growing is the proportion of people that say that it's exactly the same for them, whether to live under a democratic system or under authoritarian regime, the indifference. And that to me tells us that the real danger in Latin America is not really about military takeovers. It's not really about sudden reversals of democracy. It's about the gradual degradation in the quality of democracy, particularly when it comes to the rule of law, which continues to be a huge pending assignment for the, for the region. So th there you have a first manifestation of a global trend and how it affects the, the situation of democracy in the region. It, a second global finding that, ha that, that plays out in the region is the, the increased braceness uh, on the part of authoritarian leaders. Uh, this is something that we're seeing all over the, the world, but we're also seeing this uh, in Latin America. Uh, you know, when you stop for a second and take a look at what's happening in El Salvador, what's happening in, uh, in Nicaragua, uh, the fact that despite really grotesque human rights violations taking place in Nicaragua, there has been not a whiff of a reaction on the part of the region to, to make the, the, the principles of the, of the Inter-American Democratic Charter count for something uh, is, a, is, is, is very telling. I mean, nowadays, the price that you pay for democratic transgressions is, is much less than it was a generation ago. Um, so that the, the regional and the international atmosphere in terms of protecting democracy uh, has deteriorated in a very significant way. Now, not all is bad. I mean, one important global trend that we see also playing out in, in Latin America is that, that the electoral component of democracy has proven to be very resilient. Uh, you know, one of the things that Latin America does and thus well is elections. And we saw in the course of the pandemic that countries uh, in the region learn to hold 
credible, robust, legitimate elections in the impossible conditions created by the pandemic. This is also something that happened globally, but it's particularly true about Latin America. We've seen if, you know, elections taking place in Mexico, in Bolivia, in Peru, in Costa Rica, pretty much everywhere, uh, good elections, you know? So the electoral side of democracy is robust. And this is enormously important and needs to be protected at all costs because Let's not forget that this is a region that not until so long ago, uh, you know, where not until so long ago, power was a uh, power was determined either in the military barracks or in the mountain. Uh, now, you know, we've adopted as a foundational principle for a uh, politics in the region that the only legitimate way to access power is through credible elections. And last but not least, another global trend that we see playing out in the region is the vitality of civic action. I mean, globally, over 80% of the countries saw social movements of different kinds emerging, even in very hostile environments like, you know, Belarus or Myanmar or Cuba. During the pandemic, despite the often draconian restrictions put in place by governments uh, 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 with regards to freedom of, of assembly. Well, we also are seeing that in Latin America. The thing is, and before we get too cocky about this, that a lot of that vitality has to do with some of the things that Laura just mentioned. I mean, with the fact that the normal challenges, the, the, the normal channels of representation in Latin America are obstructed. So people are taken to the streets to, uh, to voice their their demands. And this is the way politics will be in Latin America for, uh, for the foreseeable future. Thank you, Kevin. Rebecca, of the people in this panel, you occupy a specific unique position. You work in Washington, DC. Your organization tries to foster a dialogue between US policymakers, leaders in Latin America just listening to some of the speeches uh, at the summit last night. Um, I guess that's a tough job uh, these days. Um, but so can you discuss Latin America from the perspective of DC, how US policymakers see things, whether they limit what can be done, what they're doing to help what can be done within Latin America. If there's something about the problems of democracy in the US that you think is relevant uh, to just a discussion with Latin America, please uh, feel free to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to USC, to International IDEA, and to Fundadores. Um, it's, you, you mentioned that I'm a recovering academic. Mm -hmm. um, it's really wonderful to be, be on a university campus. And Jerry, I had the pleasure of meeting two of your students. And if we're thinking about reasons for hope, um, the two students that I met who were seated right there, one is going on to do, have a Fulbright, do a, spend a year in Mexico City working on a Fulbright. And the second one is going to law school at Georgetown and she focuses on gender issues, which are incredibly important in the region. Um, Vice President Harris has been talking about women's economic empowerment and um, also gender-based violence as a driver of migration. So I'm was so pleased to meet both of you. So when you asked, so you asked about how US policymakers see Latin America and the word indifference was used um, in, in a different context. And I fear that there is, I mean, the summit, I'm, I'm very pleased that we had the focus of the president and we had a, a robust congressional participation um, yesterday. Um, but I do think that there is not the attention on the Western Hemisphere that there should be. I had the opportunity to testify before the Senate about the Summit of the Americas, and I was Senator Kane's witness, and he ended the hearing by just calling out, there were only three senators who showed up for this hearing, mm -hmm. um, which, which says a lot. So I think one of our responsibilities is continue to draw attention to the region and its importance to the United States. Um, you mentioned the situation in the United States, and I think that's particularly salient given what's happening in Washington, D.C. this week with the House Select Committee hearing and um, the importance of elections that, that Kevin point, pointed out and 
peaceful transfer of power. We, it's the United States is, is showing when we think about the resilience of democratic institutions, it's a very important when we talk about democracy in the Americas or the broader global, global um, democratic re recession to include the United States in that conversation. And I think that when the US is, is speaking to the region about democracy, I think it's really important that it do so from a place of humility. Um, as far as US policymakers and what they should be focusing on when it comes to the region, and in the context of today's panel, I agree that they should that the US should be very focused on, on democracy. It, it is a focus of the Biden administration. Um, the declining faith in democracy is, is incredibly troubling. Um, but I will point out that in the United States, 64% of US citizens um, say that democracy is in crisis or at risk of failure. So the numbers are not limited to, to Latin America. Um, but one of the, and, and President Chinchilla um, alluded to this, is that one of the reasons that democracy is under threat in the region is because people don't see democracy delivering um, mm -hmm. their most, most basic needs. 70% um, of Lat citizens of Latin America and the Caribbean report that they're dissatisfied with how democracy works. And this helps explain the, the acceptance of the democratic transition transgressions um, of a leader like Bukele, who massive abuses of human rights, yet he maintains an 80% popularity rate. Um, and this also, this is where the indifference came in, your point about the indifference between um, preference for democracy versus a more authoritarian form of government. So I think when the US is thinking about the region, um, it needs to, or it should, um, consider the reasons behind this lack of faith in democracy and focus on things like inclusive economic recovery. Um, this has been, a, uh, President Fernandez mentioned this, um, and I think actually President Biden did in his inaugural address that 22 million people in the region fell below the poverty line um, in the wake of the pandemic. Um, the inequality, um, the gap between the rich and the poor has widened significantly. Public health is another area. Um, then another area I would say is the hemisphere-wide migration policy. I'm very pleased that I think up until really this week, the tendency in the US has, when speaking of migration, it's been solely focused on the US southern border and how migration affects the United States. But migration truly is a region-wide challenge and it should be treated um, as, as such. Um, and I'll just finally mention the point that President Fernandez made at the beginning about the ed education. Um, Latin America and the Caribbean had the largest, longest school closures in the world. Um, some schools are, in some in Honduras, schools are just now starting to reopen. And then just the impact of the digital divide on education, the lack of connectivity, um, which is something I think going forward needs to be a focus. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, Luis Felipe, um, in some sense, this is a perfect segue. Rebecca talked about democracies that deliver. And I, when I think of the UNDP, sort of that's basically what the UNDP uh, is really working on with its programs, um, thinking about the democratic side, knowing that it has to deliver in terms of economic uh, well being, uh, human development, uh, if it's going to prosper. What is the UN and the UNDP doing with regards to these issues? How do you see that, I guess, the connection between the development challenges and the democratic government side? Thank you very much. And uh, it's really a privilege to be in this very distinguished panel and to be in, at USC, very nice, very nice campus. And as, as Rebecca said, very nice to be in, a, in an academic environment and, and being able to, to talk in depth about these, these issues that we deal with every day in our conversations with governments. And uh, I think the, the question is, um, it's very pertinent because at the end, in, in this brief in, intervention, I, I'm going to, I want to land in what I believe is the key word for uh, both, in a way, trying to understand the situation and trying to have some ideas to, to start uh, a positive uh, cycle of recovery. And the, that, that concept is legitimacy in, in a very specific way that, I'm, that I will mention in a minute. But I want to say also that I agree that there is an issue with the capacity of democracy to deliver. And that's why I always think of the two main ways in which legitimacy is built. 
uh, we have insisted from UNDP and, and in general, one is process legitimacy, which is a democratic side of, of what we call democratic governance. And the other is outcome legitimacy, which is precisely delivering results to people. So these are the two ways in which you can build uh, legitimacy to lead to what uh, I was remembering, you know, David Hume in the 18th century say, said, one of the main questions, uh, the main paradoxes or, or important questions for, for political philosophers was the easiness with which the many are governed by the few. And I think the key element there is legitimacy. So that's why it's very important to think about what are the elements that build the legitimacy on the process side and what builds legitimacy on the, on the outcome side. And I do want to say that in the, in the last 40 years in which Latin America transitioned, we can call it from boots to boats, we left the dictatorships and we went into, uh, into a more democratic environment, there were in, important results that we should also acknowledge. Uh, not the economic growth that we expected, and we have written a report on that last year at UNDP and the, the mediocrity of work of, of growth, but we did deliver, for example, a very important reduction in poverty, uh, improvement in many social indicators. So those 40 years, we also have to acknowledge that we're not wasted. Mm -hmm. uh, there were many important achievements uh, during those years that also created, and I would refer to this, for example, to the case of Chile, uh, to a crisis of aspirations, uh, in a way, a little bit like at Alexis de Tocqueville and, and the French Revolution. I think there was, when, when we feel this slowdown in, in, in growth, uh, the cycle, the you know, super cycle of commodity prices is over. And then uh, many people realize that that train that, you know, that was going fast in terms of, of growth, in the case, for example, of Chile, one of the three uh, countries that achieved the, the, the level of high income country, uh, that in a way was able to overcome the middle income trap, but because of the structural inequalities and exclusion, uh, so, social exclusion, they realized they were not going to benefit from that, from that process. That's one example that there are, to different extent, so, some other examples in, throughout the region, in which we left basically, as we have always say, uh, we were um, were in a middle uh, in a so, uh, societies that are middle income, middle income countries that have not managed to become middle class societies. So the majority of the population was left vulnerable. So not being poor, but not having the economic security that was needed to to face the the, the current uh, uh, shocks that we have faced. So that uncertainty turned into. Uh, into frustration. Uh, so that, that vulnerability that, uh, with which we entered the, the series of shocks, you know, the pandemic, the slow, even further slowdown of growth, and now the crisis in Europe and inflation that uh, President Fernandez very clearly uh, uh, described, that creates a, a moment of very high level of uncertainty where people lose the sense of agency, the sense of control over their own over their own lives and, and the sense that the system can respond to their needs. So it, that's the, the, the level of sort of lack of, of, of power. So I, in, in 2017, I, I led a report at the World Bank on governance and law, the World Development Report. And we said that we wanted to look at the micro foundations of power and why policies fail when people are not part, talking about le, process legitimacy, and we basically showed how these power asymmetries actually lead to, to failures of policy. Um, and I, I used to joke with my colleagues that among economists, when you talk about power, uh, people can only think of electricity. Uh, <laughs> and it was, it was very important to bring the notion that power matters when we want to understand why policies fail and, and why democracies are unable to deliver. And the part of this is that the huge power asymmetries that are reflected, for example, in the fact that during all the process in which social policies did address poverty and reduce poverty through, for example, conditional cash transfers, this was at the cost of the middle class and not at the cost of the top incomes that were untouched during that process. So at the margin, the resources went to the poor from the middle class, from the quality of services, for example, to the middle class, but not from really the top, the top incomes that were, as I said, were left untouched. 
So there is some very serious, uh, I, I believe, sense of la lack of agency. And we will address this, by the way, in our global human development report that is going to come out in a few months globally, in which we uh, look at how the uncertainty that we are facing changes political behavior, economic behavior, and social interactions in a way that could be uh, uh, dangerous for what we call democratic uh, strengthening. So the issue is legitimacy. For, with this, I finish. How do we rebuild legitimacy? We uh, look at this process and outcomes. So on the outcome legitimacy, as, as Professor Monk's, uh, mention, Monk mentioned, we work with the governments to try to improve the capacity of institutions to deliver in social services and so on. But let me talk about the process legitimacy part, which are the four pillars of our democratic governance, uh, uh, what we call effective governance in democracy uh, program at the UNDP. And we are partnering now with, with the IDEA uh, International, and we are just uh, finishing a, a also an op-ed with, with Kevin that we will publish soon, talking about this program. Uh, there are four elements that we see as key. One is the quality of elections, as, as uh, Kevin mentioned. The other is the, the crisis of representation and political parties. What is the state of the political parties and, and whether political parties are actually representing really the voters. The third is civic space and peaceful social movements that has also, by the way, is, has been shrinking the, the civic space in the region. And the fourth, very important, is the quality of public deliberation. That, uh, you know, the, the, the weakening of, of, or the reduction in the quality of the public information and the public deliberation has also led to a very uh, noisy uh, political uh, process and we're facing this in many cases. So if just to leave it in a, in a way of trying to see what we see as a way to rebuild that legitimacy, these four areas, working on elections, political representation, social uh, organization, and quality of public deliberation as a ways to try to overturn this uh, negative. Affair. Just one, one indicator that is objective and not subjective. Look at the budget, and we're preparing a note on this, the budget that has been going in the last 10 years to institutions that are strengthening democracy in the sense, for example, control on, on the executive, controls on, on, on the executive power, what is the budget that is going to those institutions? And what is the budget that is going to autocratic institutions like the military? And you can see a massive shift from investment in, in democratic institutions to a, an investment in those that actually strengthen the centralization of power. And I think that's a very worrisome indicator. I leave it there. Thank you, Luis Felipe. When I hear economists talk about power, it's what I've usually heard is statistical power. So it's not even <laughs> something as interesting as actual <laughs> energy. Yeah, sort of. So it's a, even a bit more removed. Um, um, now we're going to move into the second phase. Sort of, I invite a free exchange among you. Um, I can throw out some questions to provoke you, but if you have any things in mind that you want to add to the discussion, um, you've all listened to each other very patiently. Uh, Kevin, thank you, uh, Jerry. Well, this is this this first round was was wonderful and very, uh, you know, elicited many 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 thoughts. I mean, I, I, you know, one um, one of the things that I that I'm very concerned about with regards to the to the future of democracy in the region is this. I mean, there are several there are several things that have been mentioned here. I mean, number one, a, and here I connect something that President Fernandez mentioned with something that a, Luis Felipe mentioned. The question of inflation. I mean, inflation has shown to have over and over and over historically, a deleterious um, effects for democracy. And it so happens that with the exception of a few countries, perhaps Argentina and a few others, uh, the current generation in Latin America has not experienced inflation. I mean, this is gonna be a new thing. So the effects of that are difficult to predict, but cannot be good. And, and here is where I link this to, to, the, to, a, uh, to one of the comments made by, by Luis Felipe, which is how inflationary pressures, among other things, create uncertainty. And uncertainty is kryptonite for democracy. Uncertainty creates this notion that when, when, uh, when, uncertain, when social uncertainty levels go through the roof, 
the natural tendency is to seek the paternal, and it's always paternal, because it's always men, the paternal embrace of authoritarian leaders. Um, so this is a real danger for, for democracy. The second question, the second issue that I would like to, to mention that has been mentioned again is, is the question of the ability of democracies to deliver. And in that sense, the pandemic, as in many others, has been a very stern teacher. Um, what, has, what the pandemic has rendered evident is the weakness in terms of state capacities that we, that we see in, in Latin America. I mean, it's in terms of state capacities to provide decent public goods and services. And I'll give you just one factoid. When the pandemic struck, Latin America had 2.1 hospital beds per 10,000 people, right? The average for OECD countries is 4.7 hospital beds. Well, that's how weak public health systems in Latin America were when they had to deal with this mammoth crisis. And that's, a, that's just one example of a broader phenomenon, you know, the, it, the very limited ability to respond to social demands in the context of, of crisis and how this affects the, the, the ability of democracies to, to deliver. And my final point is, again, about something that Luis Felipe mentioned, which I think is crucial. Um, there's another danger that is real and pressing for democracy in the region, which is the, the widespread acceptance that democracies, democratic systems don't make a difference in people's lives. That's demonstrably false in light of the evidence of the past generation in Latin America. And we should never lose sight of that. Democracy in Latin America has results to show, not all the results that we would like to have, but have, you know, has some very impressive results in terms of social well-being, for instance, in terms of reduction of poverty, in terms of even of the reduction of inequality from extraordinarily high levels. So it is important not to lose sight of that in this winter of discontent. Uh, Luis Felipe has to leave in five minutes or so. Luis Felipe, if you want to add something now before you go, uh, Presidente, después. Uh, Thank you, my apologies, but I have to, to represent my institution at the uh, uh, conversations in the convention center. So um, I think one point, which I think uh, addresses precisely what uh, Kevin reiterated, which is the issue of uncertainty, and that's why we want to bring this uh, um, uh, issue to, to, the, to the conversation to, with the Global Human Development Report. By the way, also President Chinchilla had been a great ally in, in the production of the, uh, these uh, recent human development reports globally as well. Um, I think the issue of uncertainty as, as, a, as, uh, as a trigger of many uh, behaviors that could be detrimental to positive uh, outcomes that we expect, one entry point that we see as fundamental is the notion of uh, seeing this as an opportunity to promote universal social protection systems. And we have insisted a lot on this, uh, not, in, not universal basic income, universal social protection, to bring back the notion of universal provision of a minimum package of services to population financed through the same source, general taxes, perhaps, and uh, also um, with the same quality for everybody, because we have created through the social protection systems citizens of you know first class second class citizens through the informality that is fueled by by poorly designed social protection systems and the um, emphasis on targeting not as a way to ensure universality but as a way to exclude some people from from the uh, from the high quality services so we insist uh, protection social protection systems that are universal growth friendly fiscally sustainable and truly inclusive um, uh, could be one immediate response to try to provide people a sense of economic security that could trigger eventually a political dynamics that uh, can be uh, you know, in, you know, better than what we have today. 
because now what we have is very uh, targeted specific responses from, in many cases, leaders that want to strengthen their centralized capacity to control power, rather than something that is more, uh, uh, you know, socially uh, discussed, processed, and so on. So I just want to leave it there. As if you ask me one thing that UNDP is proposing to try to address this legitimacy crisis from the outcome and the process side, we will say that a discussion on how to bring back universality of a minimum package, social protection, health education, uh, unemployment insurance, and, and the like, uh, finance through the same source and so on, and look at ways to, because then the, the, the discussion of, for example, tax reforms be, no, don't, don't become the objective. The tax reform is not an objective, it's an instrument. So if we really want to think about what it means to renew a social contract, let's discuss what is the minimum level of security that we should collectively provide to everybody and how we finance that. And then we, we build from there. So I would, I would just leave it there to, to end with a positive proposal, mm -hmm. concrete proposal from UNDP. Thank you very much, Louis Philippe. Thank you for apologies. your contribution to the panel. Um, I apologize that I have to, to, to go now. Bueno, un gusto. Es un placer, ¿eh, chicas? President Fernandez. Yes, uh, I would like to kind of present a historical perspective on where we stand at this moment. Uh, since 2010, some countries in the region have been celebrating the bicentennial of our independence. I should have begun in 2004 because really the first country in the region to gain independence was Haiti. But it is forgotten always. And so we begin celebrating that from 2010 until 2025, <clears throat> all the independence movements in Latin America. Since our inceptions are, are as nation states, we aspired democracy. But democracy never came through. We had dictators, we had military uh, ruling class. It was only in the last 40 plus years that we have been able to transition from authoritarian regimes into democratic systems. Have we progressed in the last four decades in Latin America? Absolutely. Anywhere you go in Latin America today is radically different of what it was 40 years before. In terms of infrastructure development, you can see it, I'm sorry, you can see it anywhere. There's a, when you go to Chile, from the airport to the city, it's called Shanhattan. When you say, well, Shanhattan is a combination of Shanghai and Manhattan, <laughs> the notion of modernization, right? Can you imagine that we have a subway system in the Dominican Republic, that there's a subway system in Panama, that is also many other subway systems in other places? There is an indication there, there has been progress. Poverty has been reduced. Middle class has been expanded. <clears throat> People travel continuously. When I was coming to LA, I found uh, uh, someone from, from the Dominican Republic on the plane. I said, where are you going? I'm going to Wisconsin, he said. I, I can't imagine a Dominican going to Wisconsin. I can imagine going to New York, <clears throat> Washington Heights, but not to Wisconsin. And there, cheese. <laughs> well, there you go. He was going to a milk festival because we have cattle raising in the Dominican Republic. But now Dominicans go to Wisconsin to participate in the global festival about how to you, you, you milk cows, right? So it, it's a way of indicating that we have become more integrated worldwide. But the reason why we have progressed is because we have, a, we have solved politically a main problem that we have discussed on the table today. How do you access power? And before, uh, even in the 60s, in our case, the Dominican experience, uh, a dictatorship, a long-standing dictatorship was brought down, Trujillo's regime. Juan Bosch came from exile, a friend of Jose Figueres, mm -hmm. the Caribbean Legion. He was elected at a landslide, the first democratically elected president after a long-term dictatorship. Seven months after, he was overthrown by a military coup. There was a major popular insurrection in 1965 in the Dominican Republic. The slogan was to return to democratic constitution, uh, elected government, and then there was a US military occupation inspired by the Cold War, preventing a second Cuba in the Caribbean. Dominican Republic had nothing to do with a uh, socialist 
Cuban-oriented uh, revolution. It was democratic constitutionally, but the uh, Cold War environment uh, created this, this uh, decision by the Johnson administration. So when my generation started participating in politics, the idea was we aspire democracy, but it's impossible. The path to democracy has been obstructed. So the notion of revolution came through. And the, I would say the, the inspiration was the Cuban revolution. And everywhere in Latin America in the 60s, the youth wanted to participate in a revolutionary process. It was only at the end of the 70s, beginning in the Dominican Republic, where we had elections that were contested, and a change of regime, an alternation of democratic power, and then all the 80s and afterwards, we have had uh, elections as the only legal and legitimate way to access power. And because of that, we have democratic political stability. And with democratic political stability, you get economic growth, sustainable development, progress, prosperity, and well-being. The other side of the picture is Haiti. Since Haiti doesn't have stable democratic political system, it's chaotic. Uh, it's always in, a, in the midst of a crisis. So Haiti, instead of progressing, is always moving backwards, is in a state of misery. No one has an answer uh, to what it is. It's not only a failed state, it's a collapsed state nowadays. But the main reason, it doesn't have democratic political stability. What we have in Latin America that enables progress, that enables sustainable development and well-being is because we have had, for the first time in our history, during 40 years, democratic political stability. And we have to work in order to strengthen that in all, in all the ways we can. We have had three yes. positive comments in a row, so uh, <laughs> it seems it's contagious. Yeah, yeah so I mean, you want to so, serve. So whoever's up next, you know, Mine, so mine's not we're positive. On a roll here. <laughs> so, Please keep it going. Uh, the coffee's kicking in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, we should bring uh, a very important pillar uh, for democracies to. Um, um, to, uh, uh, to 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 stay to be stable to uh, to 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 have the possibility uh, to project to the future and that is the rule of law. And when I when I listen to what we have already said about the progress we have been able to achieve in our region, there is no doubt uh, any kind of indicator that you can take. You will see that we have achieved amazing progress. Uh, in fact, in terms of democracy, we are still the most successful region. Uh, 40 years of democracy, and it covered almost all the countries, um, with the exception of Cuba. All of them were democracies at a certain point. Then during the last year, we lost Venezuela, we lost Nicaragua. But uh, we didn't do enough in terms of the rule of law. And what we are seeing is that since other ki kind of, um, of, uh, of uh, menaces, um, you know, uh, search as a result, for example, of uh, the, growing, um, the growing presence of organized crime in many of the countries, uh, which is one of the main factors that explain the corruption in, 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 in uh, basically in, in Central America, Colombia, and Mexico, when you see those um, bureaucratic elites uh, making businesses with some business elites um, with any kind of disregard of ethical principles, uh, when you see the abuses of power uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there is no response coming from uh, the uh, justice system. So it is impossible to imagine that democracy can prevail uh, if you don't have a robust uh, system of rule of law. And so in certain way, the new rulers, the new leaders, this kind of unscrupulous uh, populist uh, that uh, we have already, we have now again, in our region aspiring to, uh, to take power, uh, they know it very well. They know that it is very easy 
to get access to power through precisely legitimate means because most of them, all of them um, <clears throat> have won an election, but they know that once they access to power, once that they are in government, they can ignore the other considerations of a democratic system, a democratic governance, which is uh, respecting the laws, respecting the constitution, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it, it is true that, you know, uh, that we have uh, many positive things in the region, but my message basically is that we shouldn't um, take democracy for granted. We already have two examples, Venezuela and Nicaragua. Nicaragua was a very weak democracy, but Venezuela was the only, one of the only three democracies that we had during the 70s. Colombia, Venezuela, and Costa Rica, and look what happened. And what I see now in the rest of the Central American countries is the La Nicaragua Cesión, the, 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 the Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. They are following almost the same path. And probably we will have even more examples. So uh, the rule of law is something, and also we should put attention about what is happening with the, uh, the military. Um, because they are there, they're playing a more discreet role, but they are becoming the arbiters of political crisis. That was very clear, for example, in the case of Bolivia. They are participating more and more in the economy. They are controlling many state-owned enterprises. And I can give you the cases of Mexico, the case of, um, of course, Venezuela and Nicaragua. So I'm also, you know, in, in, with, with this very weak rule of law and a growing role of the military again, and with these leaders, uh, populist kind of uh, leaders, I think that we are getting a mix of explosive uh, 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 elements uh, that attempt against uh, the democratic governments. Rebecca? So I'm gonna follow on um, what President Chinchilla was saying. And I really appreciated the way Luis um, Felipe ended his conversation about one, looking at the budgets um, of governments to see how much is being spent on agencies um, that actually control executive power. So you know the, the traditional agencies of horizontal accountability versus how much of the budget goes to strengthening the centralization of power. And he used the example of funding of the military, um, you know, what, what's the balance? And I thought that was a really powerful way and useful way of looking at it because, you know, I think when we, what President Chichia's point is excellent, you know, you have democratically elected <clears throat> leaders who then deliberately dis dismantle these agencies of co horizontal accountability. Um, and if you're looking at courts through, through even, the con even though the constitution protect, calls for judicial autonomy, you see practices like court, hacking the violations of a judicial tenure, tenure production. We see it with the um, attorney generals, sort of the um, lack of independence of um, attorney generals. Um, so the judiciary is also in rule of law, so also so important to uh, tackling corruption, which is an, a major issue in the region. But I also wanted to highlight the, the point about the military. And I say this from someone who served in DOD um, the growing militarization of the region is extre extremely concerning. Um, we see it in the militarization of law enforcement, the militarization of, of migration policies is another area. Um, the example, I mean, I think there was the, the scenes in the Salvador, El Salvador's Congress when the military went in to kind of intimidate uh, members of Congress to support um, Bukele's legislation. I mean, I agree. I think that the, the military, we don't hear enough about this, this trend. Um, and I think it's something very important for us to keep an eye on. Go ahead, Dan. Um, look, again, this is, this is very interesting, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick up on a, on a point that I found really, really interesting mentioned by President Fernandez, which is this, I mean, I'll put it like this. I mean, it, it's almost like a, like a soundbite. I guess the previous generation in Latin America uh, showed that democracy is possible. The task for the current generation is to show that democracy is good and fair. 
And that's a different task. And it's a more complicated task. I mean, what we see in, in the, again, in, in public opinion surveys in the region is that people in Latin America support democracy in the abstract, but they are deeply, deeply unhappy with democracy in practice, right? And, and, and the reason for this disaffection is, is connected to some of the things that have been mentioned here. I mean, number one, the question of the rule of law, which continues to be a, a huge pending assignment for, for, for the region. I mean, particularly, and there are many aspects to this, but there are two that are a particularly salient. The question of corruption and impunity for corruption, that's an absolutely toxic issue for democracy and not just in Latin America. We, we see it in, in, you know, from the standpoint of Latin, of, of international idea, we see it at play virtually everywhere. I mean, the effect of corruption on democratic legitimacy is a really toxic one. Uh, so this angle of the lack of rule of law has to be addressed in a, in a, in a very urgent way. And the question of public security, which is another big one that is important for the rule of law and that has an impact on the quality of, uh, of life for, for, for people. So that's one big agenda. And then the other is the question again of delivery. You know, and to go back to, to a, you know, to that notion that people support democracy in the abstract, but not in practice. I mean, look, I mean, we can make here in this room the normative argument for democracy until we go blue in the face. For the immense majority of people, what matters is whether democracy is able to solve real problems for real people. That's what matters. And I guess the practical implication of that is the the urgency of putting at the, at the heart of public debates in Latin America, the question of the quality of democratic governance. And that means a few things. I mean, there might be others. That means tackling questions of institutional design that you know a lot of. I mean, you know a lot about, uh, uh, Jerry. I mean, the, uh, how to design our political systems in ways that make them more able, better able to solve issues in a more efficient and efficacious way. And I'll give you one concrete example that I used the other day, you know, on a, on a discussion where uh, President Chinchilla uh, uh, participated in as well. The, I mean, this very, um, this very visible thing that we have in Latin America uh, and, and very problematic, the coexistence of presidential systems with highly fragmented and increasingly fragmented party systems, which we know from decades ago in political science that is a, is a, is a problematic a setup. And yet we see very little in the way of reform efforts to rethink the constitutional architecture of our political systems. So this agenda matters. Number two, what Luis Felipe mentioned, the question of fiscal robustness as a prerequisite for political systems to be able to respond to social demands. It, you know, how you collect your revenue and how you spend your public resources. I mean, th there has to be a discussion about that at the heart of a robust democratic governance agenda. The question of the quality of public administration, which is uh, a, a, a truly central one. Uh, you know, this used to be seen, you know, as a, as a, as a peripheral issue, uh, as a technical issue. It's not. I mean, you know, the quality of public administration is the tool of the trade for governments to respond to social demands. And finally, the question of trust, which as we've seen during the pandemic, I mean, trust is the arguably the single most powerful determinant in the effectiveness of governments to respond to crisis, whether they elicit the trust of the, of the citizens. 
And you cannot talk about trust again without talking about the question of corruption. If you're not serious about dealing with corruption, trust would never be rebuilt. So, I mean, this is the kind of agenda that I think should be at the heart of our public debates in, in, in Latin America, because it's instrumental to solve everything else. And I'll leave it at that. All right. Just to second Kevin's point, sort of this is from my own research, I'm putting more and more emphasis and I think sort of it's more and more important, uh, state capacity, sort of the quality of the public administration reforms that are needed. Uh, so the policy process can come up with some great laws and policy initiatives, but if it's not implemented in an efficacious way without corruption, mm -hmm. uh, sort of I think you're not going to deliver. Um, so, so I think that's sort of a key sort of uh, sort of part of the problem. Sort of, um, I don't think it's being discussed in this. You, you want to add to this? No, I, I just wanted, so we had a, hosted a mayor summit on Tuesday at um, as one of the events on the side, on the margins of the summit, the broader summit. And one of the things that came out that was really interesting, I thought, is that, and it gets to this point of public administration and trust in government, is I in the U.S. at least, there um, a recent survey shows that 72% of um, American, U.S. citizens um, have faith in their local leaders versus 25% in the federal government. And it was really, it's, this is a positive note, it was really heartening to hear from these mayors that are actually, they are delivering, um, that they, in a way, I came away, that, that the, at the city level, we see these bulwarks against authoritarianism because by solving problems like um, addressing climate change, addressing migration, the mayor of Bogota was there and she was talking about the 500,000 new Bogotanos that are now living in Bogota. You know, at the local level, I do see, I do see hope. Um, that is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that is that is true. true. I, I I would say that uh, that I would say that there there are good things happening in terms of uh, uh, state uh, and public administration reform. We can see many specific experiences uh, at the local level. I would say that we have many examples there, and also there are very positive um, developments in terms of using digital technologies mm -hmm. to better deliver public services in terms of more transparency, more efficiency, less cost to the people. I would say that there are some efforts there that should be encouraged by regional institutions, etc. My concern is, is, is about reforming the political system. Nothing is being discussed exactly. seriously. Exactly. It seems to be that exactly. it is prohibited in the region to uh, speak about something different than the presidential system. Uh, and, and, and what is happening that we are trying with two kinds of responses. One is more hyper-presidentialism because for many people that is the best way to resolve the limitations that we have uh, in terms of uh, democratic governance. So let's give the power to one strong man so he will be able to resolve everything. And let's put all the powers in his hands. Uh, and we, we can see what is happening with, with these kind of responses. But that is one of the responses that uh, uh, is being tried in some, in some countries. And the other kind of response is fragmentation. Um, electoral reforms and political reforms, they are positively aimed at uh, encouraging more participation, but the final results is they diminish governments, governance because uh, we are fragmenting the political representation. Nothing is between. There is nothing now reasonable being thought about what to do in terms of political reform. And for me, that is probably the most critical issue we should uh, resolve. Well, I think we all agree on what we're saying. <laughs> Perhaps it's a different angle that we take. Um, I would say I was trying to make the point that we do have an electoral democracy and that we have solved a historical problem that the only path to access power is through elections. And nowadays we don't have right-wing military coups or left-wing guerrillas. So it's through elections that we access power. And because of that, there has been political stability in the last 40 years. And today we're better off than we were 40 years ago. This is my point. 
Now, I understand that there is a sense of ambiguity and complexity in what is taking place in the region and worldwide. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we can borrow uh, from Dickens his metaphor, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Mm -hmm. And I think this is for Latin America and for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. huh? Now, what would be our challenges nowadays? I would say, yes, we need to strengthen the rule of law, absolutely. Huh? We need to have an independent judiciary, yes. But if you look at the polls today, what are the people really thinking about? The three major issues that are impacting citizens in Latin America. Number one, the cost of living. Now this is today. Secondly, unemployment. Third, crime and violence. These are the three main issues. Of course, there are some other issues. There's a crisis of confidence that we've talked about, and we know that is true. Political parties, the traditional political parties are just disappearing. And we have new political parties that are coming to the fore. In the last two elections, Costa Rica, something that you know much better than me, the ruling party came in third, was unable to participate in the runoff. In Colombia, the ruling party and the third was not able to go to the second round. So there is a problem with political parties, with parliaments, there's a problem with democratic institutions. They're not up to people's expectations. They're not functioning. So there is a need uh, to have political reform, but also is, you know, having political reform in theory is, I mean, is being able to really deliver to people's needs and, expe and expectations. This is a problem that we see. You take the police, for example, and this is part of Bukele's success in El Salvador because he, he has understood that through traditional institutional channels, many problems are not solved. Uh, you have these gangs, uh, how do you call it? That? That's mar Maras. Las Maras, the Maras. Well, cruel, terrible. They, they hijack people, they, they, you know, what happens? Bukele comes in, he is very, has, he has a hardline policy against them, he jails them, and he denies them lunch. I'm not gonna give you lunch today because you have behavior very bad. People applaud that, that's the way you should go. The argument that these uh, violent gang members should be respected and their human rights people respond, yes, but how about the victims? These guys are not respecting the victims' human rights, so why should we respect them? So this rhetoric, this new way of dealing with problems, which is out of traditional institutional channels, is having uh, a reception, it's, it's being considered as an alternative to what we have done traditionally, right? You look at the problem of drug trafficking, most likely military and police are participating in drug trafficking and arms trafficking. Now, if you engage the police in being rewarded with part of what has been taken away from the drug dealers, you create some, some sort of a reward, some stimulus to them they might be able to have a different way of behaving towards the problem. But if they earn $500 a month, this is their salary for a police captain, $500 a month, and the drug dealers are giving him two, $2 million, what do you expect? I mean, he sees us as a, as a game changer for him, as it changes his way of life. So we have to look at it from, I would say, innovative ways. No? We have to look at what has been put in place for the last 40 years has not worked out in terms of institutions. So we have to think out of the box, being innovative, bring new fresh ideas in order to solve these problems. This is what I think about the institutions. Now, as you see, the cost of living, unemployment, this is the problem today. But it's also about having access to water supply, is having access to electricity, having access to an edu quality education. Huh? These are the main problems. Access to a healthcare system that can really deliver. So we have an agenda of problems that have been from the past that has not been able to be solved yet. But at the same time, we're being challenged with robotics and artificial intelligence and algorithms and all this new stuff, which is the 21st century. So we're trapped, not solving problems of the past and being challenged by problems of the future. I think that we need to change our economic and social model of development. It has been, has been successful for, for 40 years. It doesn't guarantee it's gonna be successful in the future. We have had a labor-intensive economic development system. 
uh, extractive industries in South America. But at the same time, there's a widening gap between the developed world and the under the or the developing world in terms of technologies, as you said before. Well, the digital, we don't have digital markets in Latin America. But not enough, I would say. No? We don't have a Latin American Amazon, not even local. Not even local do we have uh, e-commerce developed in our, in our countries. So we, we need to move forward into a more capital intensive, technologically driven economic model. Combining with the rest, we have to solve the problems of quality of education, access to water supply. But at the same time, we need to move forward in terms of digital technologies for education, for agricultural production, for healthcare. Because if we do not do that, we are only passive consumers of high tech. We need to create new products and services uh, more value added with the use of technology. I think this is the road for the future in Latin America in, in really to move forward. So it is, yes, political reform, institutional reforms, but also a new sustainable economic and social model that looks into the future. A last comment before I open for sure. questions, Kevin. Look, it, two points. I mean, one about a, how several of these issues are uh, interconnected. And, and I'll give you one concrete example. The question of the fragmentation of party systems and the apparent lack of willingness to engage in a serious effort to, uh, to pursue political reform. Um, this creates a very perverse incentive for corruption. I mean, if you're the president of Brazil and you have to deal with a Congress where 30 plus party systems are represented, constructing a workable majority to push forward a reform agenda is, is an impossible task. There are many ways to build such a majority. One of them is by purchasing it. And that's exactly what has happened in Brazil, repeatedly. So you see how a problem of institutional design feeds into corruption. So that's one point. The second point is about what uh, President Fernandez has just said. The, the, this apparent disconnect between the, the need to pursue political reform and the more topical issues that are affecting people's lives. And this disconnect is very true. I mean, political reform is not a is 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 not a sexy issue. I mean, it's not a a, a, a vote winner anywhere. A, and this is a case yet where the urgent trumps the important. If we don't engage in serious political reform, we will not be able to solve all the other issues. At the very minimum, we have to be able to walk and tweet at the same time, right? I mean, we have to be able to solve, to address some of the more urgent issues, but we need to engage in the long-term political reform that we so sorely need. And, and the trick here, I would think, and it's a, it's a, it's a major feat of political leadership that is needed is, how to connect in the discourse, how to connect political reform to people's well being. That's the trick. And it's not an easy one to pull off, but it's an essential one in the current situation in Latin America. Okay. Uh, you have all been incredibly patient. Um, we're going to now move to the QA uh, from the floor. Um, also, uh, the people watching us online through uh, the chat, um, we have two helpers here, Natalia and Senisa will uh, take the mic to you. Can you please identify yourself? Um, why don't we start with uh, Vicky and then uh, Max, please identify your, yourselves uh, and ask your questions. Um, hello to everyone here and thank you so much for such an fascinating conversation. So I'm Victoria John Jim from the University of Southern California. I have many questions, but I'm going to zero it in one in particular, just because it's circling back to the comments that uh, particularly President Fernandez and 
Mr. Casa Zamora made about digital media technology. I think you hinted at it, but my question goes to what role do you think technology has to enhance or weaken democracy in the region? Because we have colliding effects. On the one hand, we have the usage of technology, right? Uh, in which citizens use it to participate. And I think that goes to the point of President Chinchilla with projects, civil society. So that's great because it enhances democratic behavior. On the other hand, you also have the uses of technology and you mentioned Bukele many times, who is extremely savvy yeah. in managing information and calling it himself, I am the coolest dictator in the world, right? And, and when he was candidate, it actually helped him to gain popularity. So attached to that, so as leaders, as organizations, and as we talk about reforms and communication, because technology is for dissemination, but it's also to access information. How do we make sure and ensure, right, that there's also not disinformation and that you can also show that democracy is delivering. I, I know this is an unfair question, it's convoluted, it's a lot, but I'm curious how you as leaders, as uh, leaders of different organizations can see that because again, I think President Fernandez made the point, this is the 21st century, we have a new generation, right, that wants to see democracy work. But how do you also communicate that in such a way that speaks to everyone's interest or, and also speaks to everyone's um, way in accessing information? Because it's not the same as some decades ago. Thank you. Panelists, uh, whoever wants to respond? Uh, just want to put some, some elements, but I, I will be sure that my colleagues will add to, uh, to this reflection. Um, I was part of a global commission on digital technologies and, uh, and democracy. And there was a very interesting conclusion about that. Uh, yes, technologies uh, have a very important role to play in the quality of public debate. And that, that was mentioned by, by, uh, by Luis. Um, that usually when those technologies are used in, a, in, a, in an environment which is characterized previously by polarized media, as it is the case in the United States, for example, that, that media existed before on the social media. So when you have those kind of conditions, polarized environments, high distrust levels to elites, um, illiteracy in general, not only digital illiteracy. I mean, um, deficits of education, okay? So what you will find is that digital technologies most probably will incentivize the worst of the society. Uh, so I mentioned this because it is very common uh, to blame digital technologies for all the problems that we already have in our societies and in our political systems, and also to blame them for the faults of uh, mediocre leadership that we're having in our societies. If you have a leader who doesn't mind how he is talking to his people, come on. I mean, politics is about educating the people. So you will never change anything with this kind of leaders. So in certain way, I say this because of course, I think that uh, there is a role for social media. Uh, in fact, at that time we recommended actions at different levels first, uh, the uh, technological platforms uh, needed to adopt many kind of ethical codes. They needed to make some changes uh, in the designing of the algorithms. They needed to uh, better uh, moderate the content of, uh, in some cases we discuss about the business model too. So there are many things happening in, in that side. I will also say that there is a challenge of regulation. Um, if you ask me, my preferred model is Europe. I don't like the way the United States is working with that because among other things, it is impossible to follow the example of the United States when you belong to a small economy. So in our countries, for example, we, I mean, we, we don't have any possibility to negotiate with the uh, big platforms. So the only way will be collectively 
and that is a problem because I, I don't remember uh, Latin America as divided as it is today. We are unable uh, to bring together our governments for anything in trying to coordinate any kind of policy. But the only way for those countries will be coming together to try to negotiate with the, uh, the digital platforms or, or uh, try to encourage the United Nations to adopt certain kind of, uh, of instruments. And finally, uh, we uh, strongly recommend it to invest in people, in education, in, in, in literacy. Uh, in, 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 in encouraging the public debate, in civic education. Uh, so if you bring those elements together, probably you will, you will find something different. Now, a final, a final word. Uh, yesterday, I had meetings with the Nicaraguans, with the Venezuelans, with the Cubans, those who are suffering the effects of those um, dictatorships. And for them, digital technologies is the way through which they have been able to organize themselves, to raise their voices, to denounce the abuses. So let's be careful because whenever we try to control social media or to, to, to put the power to control social media in some authorities, in some governments, we can end up with a worse result. Anybody else wanna add? Well, yeah, I would like to add to what Laura has said. <laughs> I think there's a bright side and a dark side uh, in the use of technologies. And, and the bright side is just what Laura has said. You, know? you empower sectors of society to uh, deliver a struggle against authoritarianism, against dictatorships, etc. Now, there's also a dark side to all this. Uh, we know that bots are used, uh, and that can somehow, I would say, create a false, a false perception of what reality is all about, fake news, the idea of fake news, of misinformation, disinformation, which is more than traditional propaganda. We, we can all identify propaganda, but when you're using bots and algorithms and you create messages that become viral uh, and people think that this is public opinion trend that is dominating and it's not true, you create a problem. Uh, and I think democracy is being challenged by these types of, of, uh, of misuse of technology you know, to create a false public opinion, create followers in those opinion trends and alienate people from you know, following up on what good measures should be in order to strengthen democracy and move forward. So I would say, I look at technology, you, you're looking at it from a political perspective. How can uh, social media uh, be used? We all understand it's a revolution. For the first time, you have interactive communication worldwide simultaneously. You know? uh, but I also look at it from a socioeconomic standpoint. I think our countries, Latin America, needs to move forward in terms of manufacturing uh, goods and services, more value added with the use of technology. Right? Uh, and I think uh, in order to do that, we need more, uh, a, a more, I would say, uh, tight link with the US system. Uh, I think connecting, in our case, I always see Florida because of our geographical proximity, connecting Latin American countries with Florida, the fourth state in the union with uh, technological development and anything that has to do with uh, hardware and software, I would say, how we're assembling. If we can have businesses in, in Latin America that can begin with light high tech, like uh, assembling hardware computers, but also doing uh, software development, uh, developing apps for mobile phones. Well, we can do, we can train our youth in doing this. Uh, in Costa Rica, you have Intel since many years ago. In the Dominican Republic, we created the Santo Domingo Cyber Park, which is supposed to be a high tech corridor uh, we created the Technological Institute of the Americas. We have trained over 50,000 uh, youngsters who are capable in, in different areas of technology. So it's connecting and it's, you know, it's, it's being part of a, uh, a more broad process. It's not only Latin America, we have to link to the rest of the world. In our case, it's linking more to the US, to the US system, uh, which leads uh, worldwide in terms of high-tech development. So 
I see it from a political standpoint, but also from a socioeconomic development standpoint. So we take a question from Max, uh, Sophia. Uh, Max first. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor um, Dr. Bill Chavez um, used the phrase horizontal accountability. And I'd like to sort of pursue that theme a little bit. Um, in political science, we make a distinction between can vertical talk, accountability louder, and accountability of can elected leaders. Into the mic? Is, it, is it okay? Is that, is that the issue? I'd stand up. Sure, okay, thank you, yeah, okay. So, so in political science, we often make a distinction between vertical accountability, the accountability of elected leaders to citizens through parties and mechanisms of representation versus horizontal accountability, which you mentioned, the accountability of agencies of uh, government, uh, one to the other, separation of powers, check and balances, human rights, persons, uh, offices, and that sort of thing. Um, and high quality democracies tend to score high on both dimensions. Um, what's really striking if you look at the data on Latin America, in particular over the last decade, is that there's, um, there are no cases in the region where you see simultaneously the improvement on both dimensions. In two cases, we see the deterioration in, in, in both dimensions, and that's Nicaragua and Venezuela. But mostly what we see in the region is either improvements in vertical accountability or improvements in horizontal accountability, but not both. It seems as if we get leaders who are, have powerful parties and movements behind them to which they're to some degree accountable, but who behave in ways that undermine horizontal accountability or check, checks and balances. Or we get leaders who respect the constitutional rules of the game uh, and, and very quickly see the erosion of their popularity. They become very unpopular um, and, uh, and, and there's a sort of a sense that they're not delivering. Why is it, in your view, I have my own theories, but I'd love to hear any reflections you might have on why is it, it is that simultaneous improvements in both dimensions of, of accountability seem to be so elusive in the region? This is Max Kammer from Professor University of British Columbia. So, I th so vertical accountability is right. The that's where the elections come in, fair and free elections. Okay. Um, and I would agree with what President Fernandez um, has said about the progress we've made when it comes to vertical accountability, with exceptions like the ones that you you um, called out. But I I think that. The erosion of horizontal accountability started, it began a long time ago. I mean, we saw it in the 90s in a country like Argentina under Carlos Menem. I mean, I'm just, it's, this is where there was like this deliberate erosion of these agencies of horizontal accountability. The courts are an obvious one, but the ones that you mentioned as well, where, you know, the Congress um, is supposed to be a horizontal accountability, but we see that, you know, in under hyper-presidential systems, Congress also di disappears as an agency of accountability. So, you know, my, my greatest concern is, is about these agencies of accountability. And that's, you know, I thought that's why I was so struck by this idea of looking at a budget and seeing how much of it is going to strengthen horizontal accountabilities, a horizontal accountability, because my guess is it's steadily decreased over time in the region. Um, Vice, um, Vice, these, I guess, I think he framed it as kind of more autocratic um, agencies like the military. But I think when we're thinking about the rule of law, when we're thinking about liberal democracy, anything beyond electoral democracy, the, these agencies are, are, are critical. And I think that I really appreciate the question because it's what we should be focusing on. Uh, that's one heck of a question, right? I mean, the, I guess the obvious answer is a, is a fairly banal one. Well, because these things are, are difficult, right? And that's why you don't, you don't find it easy to advance on both, on both fronts. But I'll give you a slightly more sophisticated answer, I think. Uh, I think that sequencing in the process of building a democratic system matters a lot. Um, and what I'm thinking about here is that when you take, and I'm gonna paint here with a broad brush, right? Uh, when you take democracies in the Northern Atlantic, plus, you know, the Australias and New Zealands, 
that are you know, similar in many ways. Those places had rule of law before they had democracy and before they had universal suffrage in particular, right? A, in Latin America, we're trying to build democratic systems the other way around. So we have the electoral side of democracy reasonably well consolidated and we definitely have universal suffrage, but we don't have rule of law. And the, and the problem is that the political pressures that dominate the electoral side of democracy and the social demands that are channeled that way very often work at cross purposes uh, with, the, with the notion of strengthening horizontal accountability. With the notion that you need to create checks and balances that are worthy of that name. So it, how do you get out of that? I don't know, because you know, we were dealt the, the hand we were dealt, right? When, when democracy came about in Latin America. But I'm just trying to say that the way in which we are trying to build democratic systems in, in Latin America presents particular challenges. Uh, and, you know, I, I never fail to, to remember when we have these discussions, the, the, the quip uh, uttered by, by former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown when, you know, they were talking about rule of, uh, rule of law issues and, and he said something to the effect of, well, you know, when it comes to, when it comes to the rule of law, to building the rule of law, you have to know that the first 500 years are the hardest ones, right? It, it, well, that's the way this works. I mean, this, this kind of thing it doesn't happen overnight and, uh, and it will take generations for Latin America to build decent horizontal accountability institutions, I think. I, I saw a hand at that table and that table we have Pretty little time, so we'll take both questions together. Do you want to start there and then at that table? Okay. Um, hello, I'm Kelvin Arana. Uh, I'm from Nicaragua. I just came to the US the last year under a Fulbright scholarship. Also, I do electrical engineering, so I don't have a political background. Still, I like these topics. Um, and I think that under the discussion that you had, I think it's true that Latin America has moved in terms of democracy. We don't see it as a possibility, now we see it as a challenge. But there, um, based on my experience, I see a phenomenon going on on Latin America that is related to the transfer of power. Whenever it comes that we go from one party to another one after a successful election, I see that the direction of the government changes a lot. And as we were talking now about rule of power, that takes time. And sometimes these situations um, come and politicians not democratic ones take advantage and they ask for more time on the power. So my first question under that is, how this phenomenon of trample of power can be tackled so that we can create more sustainable development in our countries? And under this context, I want to bring also um, the other phenomena that is happening, especially on, on Nicaragua, that the rule of law is not being damaged, we just changed the law. <laughs> yeah. And under this topic, I want to bring onto the table the topic of re-elections. What's your opinion about re-elections? Thank you very much. Can we take the question from that table, please? Please stand up. Um, hello, my name is Carmen Williams. I am from the Dominican Republic. And my question goes to uh, we, we know that today's society is not the same as it was 20 years ago. Um, today's society is more based on results. So from your perspective, uh, since um, Ms. President um, Chinchilla mentioned that we have now, um, we need to retrieve um, trust um, for institutions. How, how would you, um, what is your advice for us to, gain and retrieve people to trust uh, institutions. 
in order to strengthen democracy in Latin America. Thank you very much. So we have those two last questions. We have about five minutes. You have another, oh, Excuse please me, go ahead, sorry. please stand up. Hi, okay, my okay. name is Maximo Dominguez. I'm from the Dominican Republic. And it is a pleasure for be here, being here in front of you. And I wanna ask a question that I think that hasn't been addressed. For me, the democracy is democ democracy. Excuse me, it's not a thing that's just election day. It's a thing that is continuous. That is previous election day and continuous uh, every day in our lives. And I want to ask, what do you think is the role of political parties in the protection of democracy? How can they avoid the rise of authoritarian leaders? Because we know that they no no longer come with coups. And how? can we avoid the current wave of polarization? Thank you. Thank you very much. So last, last comment from the panel. I'll go first. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take the question on, on political parties because it's one that has entertained my mind for, for, for a while, as you're about to see. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in different incarnations, I've been attending discussions about uh, political parties for probably 25 years, right? As an academic, as an active politician, you know, wearing different hats. Every single one of those discussions ended up with everyone with a very serious face, including myself, saying, we have to strengthen political parties because they are essential for democracy. Uh, and that's true. The problem is that after 25 years of repeating that mantra, we have nothing to show for it. Uh, the credibility of political parties is in tatters uh, in Latin America and beyond. So it raises very interesting questions as to whether we are just flogging a dead horse. It might be that political parties, the way we understand them to be, they may be a 20th century creatures. And that the future of political representation lies elsewhere. And I cannot provide an answer to that. I mean, that's beyond my pay grade. You know, I, I, I haven't gotten there you know, in terms of my, of my answer. I mean, what can replace political parties? I don't know. I strongly suspect that part of the answer runs through this. And that we haven't been able to figure this one out. And certainly political parties have, been, ha have not been able to figure a, a useful way, a viable way to establish a, connect, uh, a connection with citizens through digital technologies. But it's a, it's a, it's a complicated question. Um, I mean, I, I would love to think that we have uh, some kind of magic wand that will allow us to, uh, to strengthen political parties, but I'm very much afraid that we don't. I mean, if you ask me where I would start, with an agenda to strengthen political parties, I honestly, I wouldn't know where, where to start. I mean, their credibility is so low. So I, you know, the, the, the action point that flows from this is one for both academia and think tanks and, and other people that work on these issues to think more systematically about the future of political representation. I don't think we have, a, a, devoted enough systematic attention to, to that issue. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Anybody okay, else? I will take the one about trust. And uh, Lionel says he will take the one about re-election. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, look, I, I, I prefer to give you uh, one example. When I was president, there were uh, people elected me basically uh, based on two major concerns. One was security and the other was infrastructure. Okay, so we needed to do something very seriously about those two areas because, you know, that was my commitment with the people. And uh, 
And I tried two different approaches, just because in one case, I knew that we had the kind of personal bureaucracy, institutional framework to do it. And in the other, because yes, it was quite different. So in security, our approach was to involve the people since the beginning. We decided, for example, to measure the problem, uh, to state this baseline, consulting the people. And national consultation, we went to the communities, we looked for the different sectors. Um, you know, it was something really very open and democratic. And once that we had a kind of diagnosis, of, of course, we also were working with, with uh, robust data, you know, many indicators, but we basically said the opinion of the people counts in this issue because security is something that takes place at the local level. I mean, the, the crime is, is local usually and, and criminality. And so we, we, we start doing that. And then we design different responses at the community level. That was probably uh, our most important approach. I mean, from the community level, we try to tackle uh, the, uh, the crime problems and we prepare the police to be able to deal with the communities uh, because there is a different way to work. They have to learn how to relate with the people because it is not only about listening to the people, it's also about taking decisions in the same table with them, establishing the priorities, responding about how you know, they are performing, et cetera, et cetera. The other area was infrastructure. And infrastructure was a totally different approach because it was almost impossible to do it differently because the institutional framework is accustomed to work in a very uh, close and obscure manner uh, in a very vertical kind of format. Um, and it was almost impossible to speak about, you know, uh, facilitating the participation and opening the process so the people could know what was happening. And so uh, what happened there, I mean, in security we succeeded. We do not only achieve our goals, but the people were very happy about the results. In infrastructure, it was a nightmare. It was a totally nightmare because everybody was suspicious if there were corruption behind the, uh, the contracts, because since we didn't consult, the people didn't want the road to, you know, to affect, for example, the environment or some communities, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I, what I say is that we have the keys about how to build trust with citizens. And for me, there is no other way than be transparent, be accountable, and the only way to, to do it is building the means, the, uh, the, uh, the institutional means, the venues, the, uh, the, uh, the mechanisms for the people uh, to be part of the process. Uh, well, I'll, I'll try to respond to some of the questions that have been raised uh, in a very broad sense, beginning with you. <laughs> All right, uh, political parties. I think there is a crisis of confidence to institutions, including political parties in Latin America, but also worldwide. I think here in the States, there is a conversation about the role of political parties. There is, there is a debate in Europe. In Spain, you had two parties, El PSOE y El Pepe, right? And now you have four or five parties. In France, two parties were leading since the end of World War II the Golistas and the Socialist Party. And now you have uh, a party led by President Macron that was just founded five years ago. Everywhere you look, parties are uh, going through difficult times, but new parties are emerging. It, it is the old parties that are disappearing and new parties are emerging, right? And it, it's happening in Latin America. So we, we cannot look at it um, in an isolated way as if it is something that is happening only in Latin America, the world is in turmoil. The world is in crisis. And I think one crisis that we tend to, to kind of uh, not, not take account of 
is there is an ethical crisis. There's an ethical crisis in everything. There's an ethical crisis in politics. There's an ethical crisis in the media. There's an ethical crisis in digital media and social media. There's a crisis everywhere, an ethical crisis that we have to meet in order to regain confidence. The lack of confidence is because people see that political leaders are benefiting from the system while everybody else is struggling. So corruption has a lot to do with that. If people see that a political leader comes into power and he enriches himself pretty fast and the rest of the people are still lacking, you know, uh, the solution of basic needs, well, there is a disconnect between political parties, political leaders, and the rest of the population. So we have to address the ethical issue as, as, as a core issue in order to regain confidence for democracy. And we have to train the new young leaders that come to the parties in, in the meaning of, of morality, of ethical, and, and, and being always accountable to the people, horizontally or vertically, whatever. But you, you must respond to the people's trust in you to lead uh, their future. I, I do believe, uh, Kevin, in uh, that political parties have a future. It's the only way that you can really organize the people and mobilize the people. Through social media, you can, in a way, connect. You, you, you communicate uh, and somehow you mobilize. But these, these mobilizations have always been leaderless and they end up in nothing. And I think the best example is the Arab Spring. I mean, you had, you had uprisings in, in, in Egypt, uprisings in Syria, everywhere, but they lack leadership because leadership comes through political parties. And the thing about political parties is that they are organized in the territory. So in each state, in each province, uh, in each uh, territorial unit, you have people that are being organized and mobilized according to the party's philosophy, ideology, and, and political objectives. The only way you can really permanently mobilize is through an organization, and that is a political party. Now, political parties need to go through changes also, and, and they are, and they are. Uh, I founded a new party just two years ago. Uh, it's called, in Spanish, La Fuerza del Pueblo. Uh, in English, you would say, the force of the people. It's very difficult to translate <laughs> and really have the spiritual meaning that it has in, in Spanish, okay? In just... Eh? The, the power of, or, or people's power, <laughs> people's power, right? Okay, in just two years, we have registered 1.5 million Dominican citizens. Uh, and polls that were taken yesterday uh, in Dominican Republic, the incumbent president has 38% of intention of the vote for the 2024 20, elections. I have 36, just two years building a new party because our previous party split the Dominican Liberation Party. And the reason it split is because the dominant leadership at the time, the incumbent president at the time, didn't understand something that worries you. He didn't understand the limits of power. Power has limits. And in democracy, the limits are the rule of law. There are rules for everything. You play, by the, you play the game according to rules. Uh, when you shoot, it's two points. If you shoot from far away, it's three points, right? And that's the way it should be in politics. You were elected for four years, according to the constitution, you respect that. You don't go over the constitution and stay in power forever. You can't, and you cannot change the constitution in order to stay in power because that, that would be unethical. You should, you're supposed to legislate in favor of the people, not for yourself, not for self-benefit. It doesn't work that way. So I think, you know, creating this consciousness that there is a limit to power, that you must play the game according to the rules you accepted, I think lies, uh, I would say, the future of a sustainable democratic system. Now about re-election, and Laura said I should respond to that. <laughs> well, I think that uh, re-election is not bad per se. The people make a decision. If President Biden is doing, doing a good job, the people re-elect him for a second term. Right Now, the U.S. system originally didn't establish that it was two terms. It could be forever. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected four times. And it was after him that an amendment within the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, established two terms. But this is, what, this is a, a decision made by the American people through its delegates in Congress. 
Now, we, we should understand that no political system is universal. We're celebrating Queen Elizabeth's 70th anniversary in power as, as the queen of, 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 uh, of, of Britain, right? Nobody's questioning that. 70 years in power. She was never elected and she is the head of state of, uh, of the UK. The Pope, well, the Pope is, uh, I would say, the Vatican is a state. The, the Pope is elected for life. Nobody questions that. Not even God is questioning that, right? <laughs> so it all depends. My belief, though, is this. Uh, you can have a system in Latin America, I would say this, where you could be enabled, you're enabled to be elected for two terms. Elected one term, if you're doing well, well, the, the citizens will decide if you stay in power or not. Skip a third term. They may be able to come back again. Now, what is the difference? The problem is, if you are in power, you tend to use the tools of power to stay in power. But if you have to step down and come from below, I mean, it's democratic. You're participating just as someone else. Now, why do I believe in this? Because democracy in the region is still fragile, it's still young. It's not 500 years old, as Gordon Brown would say, it's just 40 years old. So democracy in Latin America is still is in its infancy. And leadership comes through experience. It comes through hard work. It comes through failure. It comes through, you know, standing up again after you've been knocked down. And you learn that through life. You learn that through experience. So depriving the possibility of having someone with experience, with democratic values to come back again, but coming from below, not from above, I think it's a possibility. And it's a decision countries will have to make. In our case, in the Dominican Republic, we've had, we have had everything. We have, we have had indefinite re-election, Balaguer. So he was president seven times, right? seven times. He was blind, 90 years old, and still leading the country. And now he's a legend. He's become a legend in the Dominican Republic and in Latin America. Uh, after that, we amended the constitution. It was one, when I was elected for the first time in 1996. Don't think I'm part of a museum, right? Back in 1996, I was elected for the first time. Uh, I was not able to get reelected for a second consecutive term because the constitution banned that. But my successor amended the constitution for two consecutive terms. When he was trying to get reelected, he lost, I came back into office in 2004. So I benefited from his reform and was able to get two consecutive terms, 2004, 2008, 2008, 2012. The constitution then was amended again to come back to one, one term at a time, you one term and you have to skip the second term. This is where President Medina made an amendment. So he amended the constitution to have two terms. He wanted to amend it again to have three terms. And this is where we split, right? So I'm able by the constitution to come back again for two terms that will be definitely, unless we amend the constitution again, which is something I pledge among you that I will not do if I get back into office, okay? So this is the way it has, this is the mechanism which, uh, has worked in the Dominican Republic. Now, repítame la pregunta otra vez, ¿cómo fue? Brevemente, presidente, sí. porque tiene una reunión. Ah, ok, perfecto. Sí. Pero para no dejar los dominicanos fuera. Ok, que después me lo pero critiquen. brevemente. ¿Eh? Well, briefly, what was your question? I think I answered that. I think I answered that. And, and you... I think I answered that too. I think it's an ethical question. Okay. All right. Thank you. Rebecca, you're the last one. Hey, I'll, I'll make this very brief because I know I'm standing in the way of lunch, but um, I think I, I really love the way you framed it by saying that democracy doesn't stop after the election and that it's every day you work on it. I thought I really appreciated that. And really quickly on re-election, I agree that the number of terms doesn't necessarily matter. So Mexico, for instance, has a, you serve for a six annual, um, and for many years, Mexico was undemocratic because the, the president had the dedazo and he could pick his, his next president. So even though there was a, a term limit, it was far from a democracy. I think what's worrisome is the trend, um, and this is not the case in Dominican Republic, I wanna say is, is when a leader amends a constitution, when he's in power to stay in power, oftentimes indefinitely. Um, and that's why I think the agencies are, of course, on accountability are, are what we should be focusing on, when, um, which is part of the rule of law, because that's what enables 
an ex a dominant executive or a, a hyper president to 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 so and it comes from the right and the left right it's not just leftist or presidents from the right that do this um, but it's almost like there's been a playbook created um, and and presidents are learning from one another how to do this I'll leave it at that thank you Thank you very much. Uh, this concludes the panel. Uh, if things have gone according to plan, uh, we should have lunch boxes outside. So I invite you all to continue the conversation outside. If you have somewhere to go, you can take the lunch box uh, with you. I'd just like to conclude by thanking the panel for an incredibly substantive discussion. Thank you all, and please join me in giving a round of applause. Thank you.